there really is only one path. Well, there's two paths, I should say. There's two. Um, number one is the obvious one. You make a movie, someone sees it, it wins a festival, wins awards, wins writing competitions, could win any kind of award. That's one way. Those are creative jobs. Writer, director, actor, to some extent, producers. Producers are a dime a dozen. I mean, I hate to say it. I was one for a long time, but yeah. um, they are. And um, they're often asked out of projects because they don't really contribute anything other than, you know, an additional salary and sometimes some management expectation, but whatever. Um, you, you can go the creative route. And if you can get some kind of notoriety, you'll, you can pick up an agent. You might have an executive in town call you up and say, hey, I want you to direct another movie for us or a, the next movie or whatever that is. Um, that's one way. That's tough. Um, the other way is you leave whatever that is. If you're a producer or you're a line producer or a UPM or crew working in those, in those areas, you, um, basically go work from the bottom and work your way back up, you know, and that's tough. It's, you have some, you have a resume, you have some credits, someone will probably give you a shot in an open hole. In other words, an open labor slot. Mm -hmm. Um, it, but that's, those are few and far between their catches catch can, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But if you can work hard, you can come early, you stay late, you keep your nose down, you do a good job, you'll come back another day. You yeah. keep your nose down, you do a good job, you come back another day. Then you come back a week and you come back a month and then you get on the next show and the one after that. And 10 years on, you're like, holy cow, I built a network. I'm working here. Yeah. So it's hard. It's, it's really hard. I am Tim Tortora. I'm an outsourced CFO. I work in Hollywood. I manage finance for about a dozen producers in town who make... TV movies, episodic television, and independent features. I'm the son of two Orange County entrepreneurs. So huh. I was, but barely saw my dad. He worked, he, he, at dinner. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't see him a lot, but when we had dinners, it was usually weekends and it was five people, my parents, my two siblings sitting around the table, eating dinner, talking about whatever. And um, it was fun. It was a great family experience. Very cool. And, and uh, what was, what was it like growing up in, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial family since both your parents were, were entrepreneurs? Do you, do you remember like any of the feasts and famine type, type situations? Oh yeah, or, for sure. I yeah. can remember very clearly things being tough. My parents, they weren't poor, but they were, grew up in the 1960s in, uh, they came of age in the sixties. They had babies when they were literally babies. They were 19 mm -hmm. when I came tumbling out of my mother five uh -huh. days after her 19th birthday. Um, so they were kids raising kids and uh, they were ambitious. Uh, they both worked for businesses early on in their life and then later on became entrepreneurs. So I remember the early days of my parents going, I think we're going to, it's going to be different, but this is how it's going to go. And then the success came with that and the freedom and all that comes with it. Not, you know, crazy, stupid lifestyles, just, you know, upper middle class in Orange mm -hmm. County, California. I grew up around the studios and grew up around Hollywood and that's how I fell in love with it. I love it. And did you, were your parents in like any of the, the Hollywood businesses no. or have connections? No, completely different, huh? Both of my parents were in industries that no longer exist uh, because of the personal computer. I like to say people who complain about China and robots, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates killed more jobs than anybody on the planet in the history mm -hmm. of the human race. And that came with the personal computer, both Mac and PC. So uh, the work my dad used to do was pre-press for printing. It was called color separations. And my mom was in the travel business. Both of those can now be done on your phone. Honestly, yeah. it can be done on a $600 device where they used to be million dollar devices in my dad's business. In my mom's case, it was all about labor. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so uh, it, it's kind of funny. Um, so my dad, we used to joke uh, about this, but my dad used to be a stripper in the, in oh, the, you're kidding. Uh, my yeah, dad was the... having a conversation on the street with someone talking about the strippers yep. that were working for him. Well, we have nine strippers working yeah. for us now. <laughs> exactly. And then this lady turned her head like, what the hell am I <laughs> listening to? My dad, I kind of, my dad goes, oh, I guess I should keep my voice down, that's, even though these aren't people taking off their clothes. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, industry that's no longer around anymore. Doesn't but, exist. Uh, so your yeah. old man was a stripper. No, yep. no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I amazing. actually... Somewhere right here, I have I have an old loop of his, and it's got it's got the uh, you know the red tape with yeah. uh, with actually right here. Look at this. So I've got yeah. it, it's it's got um, yeah. uh, uh, razor blades in there, yep. you know. So he's using that as a weight, and you know that's yep. how you would you know go and cut all the film and everything. So I took off the end of this finger on one of those blades that was taped to a a, a, a red tape machine on a stripper's table. Yeah, I didn't yeah. realize it was a blade. I thought it was just the thing that comes on a normal Scotch tape roll yep. thing you pull out. Yep, 
cut off the end of my finger. I, I remember, I remember my dad had one of those tape dispensers as well. So funny, yeah. funny, small That's, world. It is a small world. That does, we, we're, we're, we're a rare breed. There are not many yeah. of us who are the children of people who worked in color separation. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, incredible. Incredible. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so what, what, what did you, what was your, your path toward getting into Hollywood, right? You, you grew up in that area. You probably had some influences, but, but yeah. um, you know, what, what did that story, how did that well, unfold? My path was just curiosity. I, I loved the movies. I loved Oscars. I would, I would, I would watch any movie. My parents, my dad took me to a lot of movies, both myself and my brother and my sister, some inappropriate for age. I mean, I was uh, 11 when Apocalypse Now came out. My okay. sister was six right four years younger than me so whatever that is do the math seven and we were literally sitting watching apocalypse now in the movie theater in the cinerama dome and uh my mom and my sister got up and left when they started got to the end sequence but um i was a movie nut i i went with my dad every, probably every weekend we were available to go to the movies we went uh my parents had tickets to the theater in other words the stage right to the schubert and the pantages theater yeah. and we would drive by melrose by the Paramount lot and we'd drive by Universal and the different lots around town. And I remember saying to my dad, what goes on in back there? And he goes, oh, they make movies in there. I'm like, what's that? And I wanna be, I wanna work back there. And that's kind of how it started. And I got interested and the assumption was I was gonna take over my dad's business or my mom's. And I remember being 19 or maybe even 18. I think I might've been high school actually, not even college yet. And I said to my dad, I wanna go to school to be a musician and I want to work in entertainment. I was a drummer at the time. I started playing when I was in the fourth grade. And I remember him being, okay, whatever. You don't, you don't have to do this for a living and whatever you want. And he was totally supportive. And uh, it, you know, that's how I got started. I started as a tape op in a recording studio because I was a music student who had to take a recording class. That was it. That's how it started. Yeah, I love it. And and obviously you've you've worked for a number of big production houses and, and yeah. all of that. How how was it to break into those types of industries and and to you know get get in front of those types of people or were, were they you know looking for you seeking your your help and you you know kind of never. came in? No, yeah. never. No one in the entertainment business seeks you out. It is that simple? There are a thousand people at their front door wanting the PA job or the assistant job or whatever it is. PA is a production assistant. You do whatever they ask you to do as long as it's not amoral or legal. I say do it. Don't say don't question it. Just do it. Uh, that's how you get the job. So no, they don't ever look for you. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard to get make to break in to make a connection. It's uh, it's it's kind of it, it's difficult to understand who's real and who's not. And you that is a skill you have to learn and figure out early on in your career. And that can be usually demonstrated by cash. If there's not money to pay people, if there's not money for whatever you're putting on the screen, if everyone's working pro rata because we're going to be famous, we're going to win, a, we're going to win at Sundance or a Can Award. Yeah. That likely is bullshit, and you should move on. So yeah. it's hard, and it's it's super social, and it is putting yourself out there all the time, and you just have to meet people, do informational interviews, and that's what I teach in my latest book is how what, how the industry is structured, who to identify that's nonsense, not by a list I give you, but by identifying them by the characteristics of who actually works and functions because it's a constantly changing industry. Mm -hmm. So, and then once you get there, how do you meet these people? How do you make an introduction and how do you get to know them? So they'll talk to you. Because if you ask me to read your script, I'm going to be like, ah, wrong guy. can't read your script. I'm a finance right. guy. But right. I was in creative 20 years ago. So who's the guy to, or girl that's now in creative that you should be talking to if you're a writer or director, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, and let's let's unpack that a little bit more too. Where you're mm -hmm. saying how you can, how you, how your book covers how you can uh, tell who's bullshit and and who's not, right? And I think that this may apply to pretty well everything in life, right? Like you you sure. mentioned, you know, look and see if they're you know if they're they're trying to do things for free, if they have any money. Obviously, yep. money follows success. Yeah. Um, what what other types of things can you uncover about a, a personality that you know, or indicators, whether or not you should be following that person, you know, whether that be taking advice from them or, or, you know, seeking out their opinions or, or trying to get hired by them. Any, any advice on any of those types of things? Yeah. Um, there's a lot there. So I'll start with the, the end, which I tell people that I, that I meet with, that I consult with all the time who are young, which is don't be so worried about who you're, what your job is, how much money you're going to make, what your title is. That's not relevant. 
You should be worried about the people you're working with. Are they quality? Are they connected to the industry? Financing? Financing in movies is the distinguishing characteristic from someone who's real and someone who's not. That's simple. And so is distribution. If you're going to work on a movie that's going to go run the festival circuit, okay, you have a one in a hundred chance of that happening. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, probably not. But in the early part of your career, you should be connecting yourself like a barnacle to the people who are making shows for the streaming networks, for the studios, for the um, broadcast and cable networks. It's that simple. So if you're finding some independent early in your career, it's, it's a path. It's a hard path. The easier path is to learn the system and the network and the, and the way the industry is structured from the financiers, which are essentially the studios and the networks, the people who exhibit movies or distribute them. Learn who those people are. And then under them, they all have a structure of producers who actually make content for them. I hate the word content. We make movies and TV for them. Contents, which you find on the internet. but uh, And you find our stuff on the net. But anyway, I won't belabor the point. So figure out who's making film and television and get into that structure. And the way you get into it is working as an assistant. You come as a production assistant, an assistant to an executive, whether you want to work in development or production or distribution or whatever. And then eventually you're going to develop a skill, a reputation and a network. And then you can expand that out to the independent space if that's what you want to do. It's a lot easier to go from working in, in the studio system into, into independent than independent into studio. Because if you come from an independent to a studio, you're starting all over because you're building an entirely different network yeah. without any bona fides and without any connections. It's, it's tough. Yeah. And you're probably looked at if you're coming from a studio to the independent, you're probably looked at as, you know, you're, you're a guru, right? You know, people are going to yeah. seek out your, your advice. Whereas the you're other way- You're a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed exactly. to a tiny fish in a giant pond that's eating every small fish it can find. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then follow that up with, you mentioned before, how you, how you communicate with these people, how you get in touch with these types of people, how you build this connection relationship with these people that- um, you know, will will you know hopefully pay off now? If not now, hopefully in the future at some point. Yeah, um, it's it's not difficult, but it's hard. So the not difficult part is identifying who you want to talk to. So basically, I'll start. I'll take a step back. It begins by understanding the industry and the players in it, and what they do, and what level they're at. And then from there, you're going to make a connection with them in some way because you've memorized and you've learned who the players are, right? You're not going to learn everybody. You're going to have to pick a vertical you want to work in. You want to work in reality television. You're, if you want to do that, you're not going to go meet you know, uh, David Kelly or anybody in his organization because they don't do reality and vice versa. You want to work for a half hour sitcom or hour drama. You're not going to go work for Endemol that makes reality TV. So you have to understand the vertical you want to work in. What job do you want to do? Writer, director, actor, producer, crew. That's it. Every, that's all there is. Within crew, there's dozens of jobs. But that's essentially the, the areas in which you can work. And then you pick a vertical. You do some research. Get on to IMDb, IMDb or some of the other databases like uh, Variety has one. That's all. It's kind of expensive, but we won't go into the weeds of it. You learn maybe you know 10 or 20 of your favorite shows. You pick them. You learn who the players are. So when I say who the players are, I mean, you start with a show, maybe Joss Whedon directed it. You want to be a director. Are you going to get to Joss Whedon? No. Are you going to get to a staff writer? Maybe. Are you going to get to an assistant in his organization? Absolutely. Those are the people who are going to talk to you. And I'm not saying don't reach out to Joss Whedon. I'm saying be careful about how you do and who and whether or not you want to take that meeting. Does that want to be your first meeting? Probably not. Do you want to practice your pitch and what your thing is and what you want to do and how, what you've learned later on down the road? Because what I teach is our skills you're going to learn every time. Let me rephrase that. What I teach is you're going to learn skills that you're going to use every time you want to level up, right? So you're not going to get to the high end people. You're not going to get to the, the sort of medium to high uh, upper end, but you're going to get to the medium to the low level. And you're going to build a network. And those are the people who are going to refer you for jobs. And they're going to say, okay, I'll read that guy's script. I'll watch their showcase. I'll show up to their material. Those are the people you're going to make friends with and you're going to network with. And then ultimately that turns into, a, it can turn into a job or a referral. This is a business of referrals, no two ways about it. And you're not going to get the referral blind or unknown. You have to make a connection to people. One way you can do that is by DMing them or email or cold calling. Or once you have the names and the people in your head, 
you might meet him at a party. You might meet him out. You might meet him at a screening. You, or maybe you're going to go to a screening or you're going to go to a talk and someone's at the same talk about a particular movie because they're re-releasing a new print of Godfather or whatever. They're Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Could be anything. That happens all the time in LA and in New York. So that you, you get to understand the industry, the players, and you connect with them. And you can do it socially on the phone or through social media. And you do it by understanding who they are and just making a three- you know, a three sentence pitch. I am a student currently looking for work as a PA in dramatic television. And I'd love to talk to you about your career. And then you take an informational interview. And in that interview, you sit down, you get 20 minutes, you let them talk one simple question. How'd you get to where you are? People talk about themselves. They're good at it. They understand it. They like to talk about themselves and you just listen. And at the end you say, I love it. I'm interested in what you do. Uh, if you know anybody who's looking for a job, here's my resume. Never ask to read your script, come to your showcase, watch your short film, give you a job. The moment you do, they will ghost. And you have to set up a referral. And you do that by just demonstrating you understand the industry, their place in it, and be interested about them. That's it. Love it. And, and I, I think that that is advice that you can use. And again, pretty well, any industry, right? You know, it's absolutely out. true you know, find out who, who it is that you're trying to reach and, you know, try to build a relationship with them, try to build that, that, uh, you know, unique, uh, authentic relationship and connection with them. So love it. Well, yeah, it's, it's a, I think that's an important word, which is authentic. It, this mm -hmm. part of it, you're always selling. Selling doesn't have to feel icky. Like you want to take yeah. a shower and you're asking for something all the time. You just make friends and make a list and call them up and say, Hey man, what's going on? Oh, by the way, I'm looking for work. If you know, anybody who's looking for whatever. In my case, I was a production accountant. That's how I came up. I'm looking for work as a production accountant. And I kept a list of those people and I kept in contact with them throughout my career. And they referred me for jobs. That's how I got work. And, and that leads me perfectly into, you know, the next question was, you know, how did you get into the financing side of things? Was that, was that a passion of yours? Uh, you know, as you were, as you were going through and saying, you know, I, I could do all these different jobs, were you right. always fascinated by the money and the, the numbers and all of that? Is that the reason why you went that direction or was there some other, um, some other reason? I, truthfully, I fought it. Honestly, I, I didn't want to do it. I, I, I hated it. I wanted nothing to do with it, but um, you know, sometimes you realize that things you're good at, you shouldn't fight it. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is I got into it because I was a PA on a TV show called Dream On. So I started as a tape op. I graduated with, I did that throughout my college, uh, the, the years I was in college, I graduated with an advertising degree and I went to go work in advertising for Columbia Pictures and TriStar Pictures on at an ad agency. I didn't like the ad agency ad business. I left it. Um, I was, I got, I was about to be promoted and my salary was going to triple at a different, at a different agency working on the universal business. And I just was like, I don't really want to be that guy. I want to, I want to work in production. So I took a, took a job as a PA on a TV show that had three days of guaranteed employment. And it was just transient labor. And I, I stayed there for a year and I got to know all the departments on the show. Uh, grip, electric, camera, set deck. I, I can't, I mean, writing, research and finance. And the one place where I really seemed to, where I, I was good at it and I, I made good contacts was in finance. And I realized because of a, a, a mentor of mine, he doesn't even know he was a mentor, but he was a, a man called Ron Malotsky, who was the, 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 the line producer of the show. And he just kind of, he would give me these really insightful quips about the power in this business it was with the money. The power is with distribution. The power is at the top. The power is having a, an, a staff of employees who you can tap into to build a crew around an idea that you pick up from a studio. So mm -hmm. when I realized from learning from Ron where, all, where that power kind of came from, um, and, and the power also comes from showing up early and reading the scripts where most people don't, they just, they just break down their thing and they do their job. I was doing all of that. I read all of the guild agreements, writers guild, directors guild, producers guild. I didn't exist actually at the time, um, writers, directors, and actors. Those are 1200 page agreements with eight point type in them. I sat on the couch every night after the, when the set was still live and I was running film to the lab at two o'clock in the morning. So from 5 PM until 2 AM, I'd sit there and read these agreements. So I got educated. I learned, I understood from Ron and I got, I realized early, and this is another thing I say to people, figure out what you're good at. And when you do lay into it, do it 
over and over and over. If you're not good at ideas, I'm the guy with the most obvious idea in the room. I'm not a great creative. I learned that early. I stayed away from it. I was a finance and logistics guy. I can, I can think forward about what steps I think are going to come down the road and anticipate problems and, and finance or budget for them and telegraphing a little bit of human behavior. There's a lot of psychology in any business, but especially working with crew because it's all transient labor. You don't, you don't have this thing over their head called employment. They can be gone in a day or three weeks onto another bigger, more interesting show. Yeah. So you have to learn how to understand people and behave. And that's how I got into finance because I was, I seemed to be good at it and I became very good at it actually. And then I kept getting referred and getting jobs. But early on, I realized that was the thing I was good at and I was natural at it. I didn't have to work at it really. It just kind of came as logical. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you've mentioned, you know, a couple of um, production houses that you, that you worked for. I know Harpo was another one. What was, what was the moment like where you, realized, you know, wow, you know, I've made it, you know, the, the, these are like real, real production <laughs> houses that are, you know, reaching out to me. I'm not, you know, trying to, to, you know, go and, and, you know, beg to them. What, what was that like when you, when you finally realized that? Um, well, what the, uh, I'll, I'll come back. What the, there's two answers to that question, or there's two questions in what you just asked uh, that I, that I, that I, that bring a thought to mind. One is, uh, what was it like? And the other one was, when was it? It was mm -hmm. when I became the head of physical production for Harpo Films. Kate Forte, who ran Oprah Winfrey's film and TV unit. I had nothing to do with the show in, in Chicago. That was the Oprah show. Mm -hmm. But in LA, we had an overhead deal at Disney for, me, for features, and we had an overhead deal at ABC for television. And we sold a series. I didn't. It, Kate and Oprah did. Sold a series to ABC called Oprah Winfrey Presents. It was six two hour movies made entirely from books. This is in 1996. Mm -hmm. At that time, every almost every television movie was women in peril, someone crashed in the side of a mountain and survived. And they made these, or those true crime, you know, that kind of thing. And they made these just terrible, really insidious two hour movies. Now, when I say insidious, meaning people love them. They really wanted to watch them, right? But Oprah was like, I want to raise the bar. I want to make small features for television. So Mad Men and all of those kinds of shows you see today that are drama on television, that didn't exist in television. That, mm -hmm. that came along, not because of Oprah Winfrey, but she was one of the early ones. You also couldn't get feature actors to do TV movies. So our thing was, we're, we're developing from books, we're making feature style of movies on television budgets, and we're getting feature actors to come in these lead roles. Mm -hmm. And that was the package they sold to the network. My job was to execute them. So when I got there and I started doing that job, the first movie, I was, uh, honestly, I was just keeping my nose above water. I was mm -hmm. treading my nostrils. The water was up to here every day yeah. for probably six months. After that movie was done, I knew a lot about production. I'd been on a lot of productions. So that part wasn't hard for me. It was the financing part. It was dealing with corporate. Where's the money going to come from? How are we delivering? Those were new systems I hadn't learned yet. And like anything else, you do it once, you figure it out. You do it twice. You probably get pretty good at it. Third or fourth time, you're really good at it, right? So in the movie business, we do that thing. We, we do a startup every, you know, every time we make a new movie. It's a new startup, dealing with people, building infrastructure, finding financing, all of that. I did three or four of them a year for 10, 15 years. So imagine doing startups at that clip. Uh, you learn, you get really pretty good at it. And so does everybody around you, right? It's not just me. It's everybody in the grind gets really good at it. So I, Harpo was that moment where I was like, the second movie where I was like, okay, I got this and I can pick up the phone and call just about anybody around town and they'll take my call. Um, and then what was that like? It was... Um, I was young. I was 31 years old. Uh, had I had crazy financial success and that kind of success any earlier in my career, I probably would have a drug habit and a stupid expensive <laughs> car. Yeah. But I was surrounded by really smart people who were uh, Kate Forte, who gave me that job. She gave me the, exec the key to the executive washroom. That was it. She was the one who lit my career on fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm forever grateful to her and I have, you know, nothing but great things to say. She was a great boss. And um, it was like, 
you know, it was amazing. It was also an experience I'll never have as long as I live. One of the things that came down from Chicago was, look, I make plenty of money here. Don't lose my money in LA. I want you to put all the money we make from the network and from the, um, the foreign distributors. I want that all to go on the screen. That will never happen as long as I'm alive. So I, it was an amazing place to work and I can't imagine ever experiencing that again. Love it. Love it. And, and so now you are, uh, you know, you're, you're working as a CFO for a number of companies, yeah. correct? Yep. Yeah. So talk about that transition. I mean, did you, did you, you know, separate it at some point and say, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, done with working, you know, in this capacity and, and now I'm going to move on and help, you know, a bunch of other, you know, a bunch of other, uh, you know, I don't know if it's shows or if it's, you know, uh, production departments or what it is, you know, how that, how that all works in, in uh, Hollywood. But, um, you know, talk a little bit about that transition from, you know, again, working for, you know, a yeah. certain production and then, you know, going out on your own and, and you know, doing that for a bunch of different companies. Um, so, well, the, it was largely precipitated by, uh, I was bored, honestly. I was, it, it's, I remember I was on a picture, I was on a Benji movie in 2003, 2004. And I had said to one of the producers, I was like, you know, it's just getting a little cookie cutter. I've been doing this almost 10 years and it's kind of the same. It's a little bit boring. I'm, I can do it for, you know, another 20 if I wanted, but I was kind of bored. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of floundered for five years, actually. I worked on Jackass the movie as a unit production manager. I um, I was I worked in Prague for a year on a bunch of, of projects, and then I came back and I was on. I, I started working for Mandalay Entertainment, actually the sports action division. And I made a, a snowboard documentary, and we were traveling all over the world. It was amazing, but it was exhausting. And then I got on a movie that got abandoned in Mexico. I actually wrote a book about that experience, about an ex a similar kind of experience, not about that particular experience, about working in film production. And I was, I was getting really bored for another five years. And I got married and I was in my first wedding anniversary. And I was literally in Monterey, Mexico, working on this movie that fell apart. Mm -hmm. And I came home and I said to my then wife, I said, you know what? I think I'm done doing production. I don't, and I, and I was exhausted. I came home. She's like, I have... I, I have known you for a, a good long time. I've never seen you sleep 10 hours a day. I mean, six, seven, eight, that's per, eight hours is a long day for a long yeah. night for me to get sleep. She's like, you're sleeping 10 hours. This is not a sustainable plan. And I'm like, you're right. And I was away and I don't want to be away. And we wanted to have a kid and I didn't want to be away from my kids. So I, I had to figure out how was I going to stay in production, take the skills that I had and, and apply them into the industry in a way where I could stay in the, in the, in the, in some kind of production track. And that's how I found my way into the CFO seat, you know, and, and I, I love it. Did, did anyone push you in that direction or is that something that you thought of on your own or, or like you tried at first and said, yeah, maybe there's something here and you kept growing. How, how did you, how did you um, get into that? Again, it was because of somebody called, I was, I was working with a client. I had one client who I can't remember. I think I was his accountant. Anyway, my old, I'm one of my old business partners. I sold my half of the company to him, um, Jeff Rowe. Uh, in 2008 was like, I'm, I'm just like, I what Oh, you know what? He was the editor of a movie I made at Mandalay. Okay. And Jeff called me up and said, I'm having a really hard time uh, try, finding someone who can do the finance part of my company. I need help. Will you come consult for me? And I was like, sure. So I went, I was there for a few weeks, got some systems put in place, uh, maybe there for about a month and a half, two months. And he was like, will you do this job? Will you be my CFO? I'm like, Okay. Yeah. And then his business manager was a woman who is my, one of my biggest clients now was uh, his business manager. So they shared this individual and Jeff had said to um, the business manager, she had called and said, Hey, do you know anybody who's uh, a CFO? I have a client who's looking to fill a slot. And he's like, yeah, I have a guy here who's part-time who's kind of doing it for me and producing on the side. You should talk to him. And he did, she did. I've met with my current, one of my current clients, and that's how I got into the grind and built a business around there. So it was all mm -hmm. based on reputation and the work I'd done and just sort of talking around town. Mm -hmm. So I, it I just kind of happened, honestly. Yeah. I knew I wanted to stay in it. I knew I wanted to stay in finance. CFO was a job that made sense to me. There were lots of those jobs around town, not a lot, not thousands of them, but there were a hundred or 200 jobs like that with those titles. And that's how I got, that's how I sort of 
navigated toward that direction and found that work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And you mentioned earlier that you you don't feel like you're creative, but I I I beg to differ. I mean, I think that you you've done a great job of creating you know, creating a life for yourself. And hmm. there's there's been there's been elements you know throughout this entire. Uh, you know, this entire talk here where you've, you've, you know, drawn on, you know, those creative things where you had to figure things out. And I mean, you, you figured this, this part out, which obviously right. has led you into, uh, you know, quite a, you know, quite a, a, a career there being connected to a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different industry folk there in Hollywood. Um, what, what, what would you say for someone who, is I mean, we, we touched on, you know, all the networking and, you know, kind of breaking into the industry. Um, you, you did, you did say like, if it, it, it sounds like the independent film path is easier to break into than the studio yeah. path. It is uh, to some and, extent. And, and would you say, what would, what advice would you give someone who's, um, who's, chosen to go down that path again, maybe it was the easier path to get into. And they were in a situation where they, you know, needed something to start happening. Um, how would they, how would they transition from, you know, from the studio or uh, from the independent, independent into the, the studio? studio? Yeah. Yeah. There really is only one path. Well, there's two paths. I should say there's two. Um, number one is the obvious one. You make a movie, someone sees it, it wins a festival, wins awards, wins writing competitions, could win any kind of award. That's one way. Those are creative jobs, writer, director, actor, to some extent, producers, producers are a dime a dozen. I mean, I hate to say it. I was one for a long time, but um, they are. And um, they're often asked out of projects because they don't really contribute anything other than, you know, an additional salary and sometimes some management expectation, but whatever. Um, you, You can go the creative route. And if you can get some kind of notoriety, you'll, you can pick up an agent. You might have an executive in town call you up and say, I want you to direct another movie for us or a a next movie or whatever that is. Um, that's one way that's tough. Um, the other way is you leave whatever that is. If you're a producer or you're a line producer or a UPM or crew working in those, in those areas, you, um, basically go work from the bottom, work your way back up, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's tough. It's, you have some, you have a resume, you have some credits, Someone will probably give you a shot in an open hole. In other words, an open labor slot. Mm-hmm. Um, it, but that's those are few and far between. They're catches, catch can. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But if you can work hard, you can come early, you stay late, you keep your nose down, you do a good job, you'll come back another day. You yeah. keep your nose down, you do a good job, you come back another day. Then you come back a week and you come back a month. And then you get on the next show and the one after that. And 10 years on, you're like, holy cow, I built a network. I'm working here. Yeah. So it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Yeah. Love it. And, and again, getting back to your creativity, you mentioned that you've written a couple of books as well. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what inspired you to write the first book? I mean, was there, was there um, something that was, that you mm. wanted to you know, bring out into the world or was there, you know, was the, what was the reason why you started, you know, started down the writing path? Well, I had this experience uh, on a movie that fell apart. Financing was raised on the 11th, and I was the line producer. And on the 11th day, uh, the picture, the producers ran out of money. They didn't raise all the money they said they were going. They had were supposed. Mm-hmm. They said they had raised. Um, they had raised half, and they came to me on the 11th day of principal and said, "We got to shut it down. We don't have any more money." I'm like, well, "You only spent X, and we have Y." And they're like, "No, we don't have Y. We only raised X. Sorry, shut it down." Mm-hmm. So, and then they left town, and then um, I was that was like on a Monday by Friday, I left the country and um, had to get 53 cast and crew out. And in the process, um, the federal, the, the Mexican government threatened to throw me in jail, me wow. and my production manager. And um, it was messy and it was scary. And uh, it just brought back all of these memories in my career of people who I'd met in the past who were similar to this situation, who were similar in in uh, how they operated, you know, what, what they had done, their behavior in the past. And I just thought, you know, I want to tell a story to young film entrepreneurs, people who want to invest, people who want to come work and just sort of be a, a, tell a story from my experience on this movie and working with a whole bunch of other people. The book is largely organized around my experience in Mexico and almost being thrown in jail and, and, and that experience. Mm -hmm. But 
the people in it are all people I have met and they're kind of a conglomeration of different producers and actors and crew and all these different kinds of people I've met over my career. And uh, it's really telling a cautionary tale to a, to a young internet entrepreneur, a rich IT guy who shows up and says, I want to invest in a movie. And I'm like, ah, bad idea. Here's why. And I walk him through the whole thing. And I explain my experience on this movie and, you know, was conglomerating all these people and bringing them together. And these are the barn animals you're going to be working with. This is a business of, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, I don't want to call people who work in the film business con artists because they're not, they're hardworking people by and large, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of con artists who do come here who don't really participate. Um, they say they do, but they really don't. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of tell a cautionary tale about that. And this is what it really, this is what the deals really look like, right? This is how a movie deal comes together. And this is one particular idea that came together, but is nonsense. And in retrospect, I, I shouldn't have taken the movie. And when I asked the producers, do you have the money? I knew they were lying. I could tell, I could see in one of the producer's eyes. He looked up, he looked down, he looked up, he looked back at me and said, yeah, we have the money. And I knew mm -hmm. at that moment, I'm like, they don't have the money. But then I thought to myself, oh, I'll give them some, maybe they'll raise it later. Excuse, 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 greed, yeah. greed, greed, bullshit, 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 right? And I'm like, okay, wait, I can make how much and what amount of time? Okay, I'm gonna go with this flow. And I knew I shouldn't have. But mm -hmm. anyway, in retrospect, it's a cautionary tale about greed. And mm -hmm. you should be candid and honest with yourself. And when you're not, you will get hosed. And that's what yeah. happened to me. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Again, that's that's insight and and advice that you can use in any in any situation um yeah and and so we raise we raise funds for large multifamily you know apartments right so we have to go yeah. through and put together this entire you know prospectus this is what the you know this is what the income is going to be this is what right. the you know the rent projections are going to be after we do you know this much worth of capex and all of that do you have to put together a similar like in in real estate it's called no m an offering yeah. memorandum which basically yeah. tells that whole story do you have to put together the same type of thing for for movies to to talk about that whole like this is if you invest this much this is what the potential return is going to be or how does how does that work so it's in two columns. If you're selling to a studio or a network, what you're really doing is just pitching an idea. They're going to look at story and someone's going to manage that. It doesn't make sense. Does it fit what they're putting out in their, on their platform? Every platform, whether it's a streamer and the streamers have different verticals within that platform, a network, whatever it is, they do a thing. For example, Lifetime, movies for women, that's a thing. So you're not going to sell them you know, a Baz Luhrmann picture about the, the Wolf of Wall Street ain't going to happen because that's yeah. not what they do, right? I'm using a ridiculous example, but that's right, one. Right, so yeah. uh, when you're selling to those places, you have to understand what they make. And if they're making blue shoes, you're not going to sell them red shoes. You got to sell them blue shoes, right? A friend of mine who, uh, you know, she's not with us anymore, but she used to have a thing called the blue shoe, red shoe parable. If you're a writer, director, actor, and you're, and you're into blue shoes and they're buying red shoes, if you want to make a living, you better learn how to do red shoes until they start buying blue shoes because you're not going to be able to work in the business. You got to find another way to make a living. So that that's that's really story script. And when I say script, when I say you have to bring a piece of material, don't bring a full script. No one's going to read it. No one's got two hours to plow through your movie to see whether or not it's any good. It's going to be a page. It's going to be two pages. It's going to be story beats. It's going to tell them what the story is. What's the arc? What are the characters? That kind of thing. So that's that's the story side of it. On the independent side, there is a whole deck like what you're describing. It's called the private placement memorandum. Mm -hmm. And it is very similar to the multifamily decks I've seen. That, But it's not about like, is it a minor reposition or full reposition? It's more like, it, it's less of that. It's less about the CapEx. It's less about the, you know, here's the funding structure. Here's how much we need today. It really is. It's a stars and shooting for the moon kind of document okay. by and large. It's very uncommon. I've seen a couple of them. Um, I, Crazy Heart, which was a great package that I would consulted on going on 20 years now, 15 actually, uh, with a producer. Uh, Crazy Heart was a movie that Jeff Bridges was in. It got made independently. It wound up getting picked up by one of the distributors. I think Lionsgate. It might have even won an Oscar. If not, Jeff Bridges was nominated for one, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it did really well. And it was a great independent film. Those are the anomaly. They, they, they just don't exist. They're not ubiquitous. But 
there are all these shoot for the star documents at our PPMs that say, look, like water for chocolate was made for $600,000 and it grows to 120 million. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I've got one on, on my brain that is a horror picture uh, that was shot in the woods in the early it, aughts. Was that Blair Witch? Yes. One? Thank yeah. you. Blair Witch Project. There's another. I see that one all the time. Yeah. Blair Witch, um, like water for chocolate, Little Miss Sunshine. I, we see them in, in PPMs all the time. Anything with odd financing structures that involves insurance and wraps and bond issues and uh, standby letters of credit, it's all BS. But I see it floating around all the time. Um, really, the truth is you just got to find quality people. The, the movie Crazy Heart that was made with, ultimately they got made with Jeff Bridges. Mm-hmm. It was being produced by Robert Duvall, a serious producer who's connected to Hollywood, who has a track record, who has experience. Those are the kinds of movies you give millions of dollars to. Do you give hundreds of thousands seed money to a young up and coming director who's made a couple of student films, who went to one of the big film schools or even a medium film school, but, or has built an audience? Yeah, you give them a couple hundred grand, but it needs to be in an instrument through a PPM that explains how everybody's going to get paid. I, I, I consult on, on that, that stuff sometimes because there's a lot of ways to rip off investors in this business. And the people who are raising capital, they're not really worried about the financiers. They're worried about their career. You know, in multifamily, you're not going to find new investors if you don't make money for those folks, right? The same thing is true here. It's just slightly different. And there's not a tangible asset that you can liquidate at the end to get your money back, yeah. right? That's the problem. You're, you're, you're basically investing in an idea and it may yeah. work and it may not. Yeah. Makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, I've always wondered how, uh, how the, the movie industry and, and, you know, television industry, you know, worked, especially today with like, you know, the networks like Netflix and all of that are, are, are those types of, of productions doing the exact same thing or are they trying, yeah. are, are those, they're, they're trying to get picked up basically, or they're trying yeah. to sell the story to, yep. to those types of networks. Yeah. Netflix, it. the television industry and studio movies, those are all based on writers, stories, ideas, actors, directors who have a track record or who've written something amazing, right? Um, the, the, what I described in the PPM space, that's exclusively an independent film. Mm-hmm. And the strategy is give us money. We make an amazing movie. We take it to the festival circuit. We go to all the acquisition people around town and overseas, and we make you a whole bunch of money. And you're going to be rich and you're going to hang out with XYZ star and you just might sleep with one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm being sarcastic, but that's Mm -hmm. certainly the underlying tone that happens all the time. It's a little filthy, but it is what it is. And you're going to meet these people and you're going to get to be on red carpet. I I said to an investor once, I'm like, look, you're spending $3 million on a dog with fleas. If you want to do a red carpet, give me $30,000. I will do whatever red carpet, wherever you want with all the shit you get normally and you'll save a lot of money and you won't <laughs> yeah. lose anything and you'll get that same experience. Yeah. He laughed and uh, he invested $3 million in a dog with fleas, never made a dime. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Do you think a, a lot of it is with the, the mindset behind, you know, I could, I could be I, part of this you know, amazing thing. I could be on the red carpet. Like there's that draw to, you know, um, being looked at in those, in, in that light. Do you think that that's what a lot of people get sucked into yeah. uh, more often than, you know, actually believing in whatever the project is? It's what I call the bored rich guy. And it's the guy sitting around and it's not usually women. Women are, as far as investments go, my experience, and I'm completely generalizing and I will admit that women are savages when it comes to investing, buying stock. When women will say, this is a dog, it's losing money, get out of it, lose. Mm-hmm dudes will be like, Hey, it's going to come back. We're going to be rich women. And the same thing with the investment space in in movies, men, dudes seem to want to be a part of the business. And it's less about that than it is bragging at the dinner table with their friends. I'm invested in a movie. We're going to make a lot of money. It's going to be great. Not, it's probably not going to happen. It's pretty uncommon. Yeah. Yeah. There are funds you can get involved with, but they are funds that are connected to producers who have a track record, who are connected to distribution, who have, name actors in them, A and sometimes B actors, doesn't have to be you know Tom Cruise every time, but those movies, um, they, they, they can make money. It's pretty hard when you look at the finance and the economics of the way 
money earned at the box office, that $100 million, $134 million Tom Cruise movie, and then the following weekend or two weeks later, the Jurassic picture that opened into big mm -hmm. box office, by the time that money grinds down to the investors, you're lucky to make 2% of that wow. $134 million. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. everybody's yeah. taking a cut. They got their hand in your pants. And yeah. at the end of the day, you're the, you're the last guy to get paid. Yeah, interesting. So that's why it's a shitty investment. Yeah. If you're going to invest in it, invest in big funds and invest in a distributor, someone who's actually second in line to get paid. Mm -hmm. And if you can sell direct to consumer, that's even better. That's, a, that's where our industry is going. If you're a creative and if you're an investor, you should be focusing on direct to consumer and micropayments. However, that's going to come about, whether it's NFTs or it's crypto. I know crypto is, you know, everyone's shitting on it like it's a dumb technology. It's not. It is the future of finance and it is the future of our business and creatives having an ability to sell directly to consumers. It's going to happen. Question is, is it going to be in five years, 10 years or 50 years? And I think it's going to be in five. Yeah. You think it'll, you think it'll turn that fast? I do. Yeah. yeah. Our industry since, since uh, I was going to say September 11th, um, I'm aging myself. Um, <laughs> our industry since COVID has accelerated the trend 20 times. Mm -hmm. And I think the studios and the networks realize that. And that's why they're pushing so hard to keep people in movie theaters. But consumers at the end of the day, they want TikTok. They want free shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And our job still has always been, and it's become more difficult to extract money from consumers such that they'll open your wallet, their wallet, and pay you to see your shit. That's mm -hmm. always been hard and it's gotten harder with, you know, whatever it is, 35, 40 second TikToks and Reels and Facebook and Instagram and all of that. So yeah, it's just tough. more, yeah, more distractions and it's harder to, harder to stand out above yep. all the noise. You yep. know? So Tim, this is, this is fantastic. If people want to learn more about you, your books, your, your CFO services, what would be the best way to reach out and get in touch? Uh, best place to find me is at timtortora.com. And my last name is spelled T-O-R-T-O-R-A. You can get me there. There's a bunch of social channels you can click on in the upper right, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. I Everything I publish on the blog, I put up there as well. And then uh, if you want to ask me a question, just there's a form at the bottom, ask me anything. And it comes to either me or it comes to my assistant. And I typically answer all of them, whether it's, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Good luck. Or I can actually uh, provide a qualified answer, then I will. Yeah. Love it. Love it, Tim. Thank you. And, and I, I love the progression of this, this podcast. We, we started off with, you know, our fathers and the, the business as, as it, uh, you know, as it's no longer in business. And then, you know, we, we, uh, you know, it ended off with predicting what the future is going to look like. So, so thank you. Thank you for all the insights and the time and, um, you know, your experiences in this, in this industry. My pleasure. It's a, it's a great industry. I love it. And it's not as difficult to participate and compete in it as you would think, but it is a process and you got to learn it. Mm -hmm.